And with uh, what's happening in the Middle East, there's this uh, collective uh, response, which is a human mass in some space at some time, which is a very large threat. It's an obvious threat. Um, but what sort of threats or what sort of uh, systems do we have in place in the West to create the same pressure uh, to effectively move change? Or is it even possible to get sure, to the it's point? possible. Take a look at Wisconsin. Actually, one of the uh, dramatic moments of the past couple of months was when a labor leader in uh, Egypt, one of the leading labor leaders, and incidentally, those, uh, 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 the uprising is substantially labor-based. Uh, there's been a militant labor movement for a long time. But uh, one of the Kamal Abbas, a leading labor leader, sent a message to Wisconsin workers, a solidarity message saying you supported us in your struggles, we support you in your struggles. Well, that's what the labor movement's always been about, solidarity, mutual support among people of the world. And Wisconsin, there was a huge democracy uprising. Um, there were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets uh, protesting, take over the state capitol and so on. That's significant and, you know, frightening to uh, 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 power systems. Uh, they had assumed the governor and, uh, and the Cook brothers, who you know, big multi-billionaires are supporting him, that they had found a winning strategy to wipe out the last remnant of uh, uh, the union movement. They're very concerned about the labor movement because that's the one organized barrier to corporate tyranny. And there's been a huge attack on it. It's practically gone in the private sector, but it remained in the public sector. And this was uh, uh, kind of the cutting edge of an attack to try to destroy it in the public sector mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, and there was a huge backlash, which they didn't expect. Fascinating. Well, they, they happened to win the legislative battle, but uh, like most struggles, that's not the end. Sure. Every outcome is just a stage for what happens next. Sure, sure. I suppose, too, the big challenge is that we're always sort of speaking about it in terms of uh, the hierarchy, and so there's always a them and a us and a people and the people who are making these changes at whatever levels. Um, but is there ever a capacity or a possibility of coexistence where it's just us? And uh, you get rid of uh, hierarchical and authoritarian structures. It's just us. So how do we go about, doing mm -hmm. that? How do we go about uh, eliminating those? Well, and do you think it's actually happening in the Middle East? Or wherever? Oh, in the Middle East, it's happening. It's actually happening. It's happened uh, to a substantial extent in uh, South America in the past 10 years. In our own history, it's happened. I mean, just take the last uh, 50 years or so. I mean, there's a, uh, we, we happen to be in a period of regression right now, but if you just think about the past 50 years, there's been quite a lot of uh, progress in freeing the society. For example, um, uh, 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 say the civil rights movement gave uh, the African-American population a limited freedom for the first time. I mean, they had it for a couple of years after the Civil War, but then it was beaten back. Uh, but they at least got uh, some minimal rights. Sure. That's important. Uh, the women's movement had a huge impact on the society. That's, uh, look, until uh, the 1920s, women couldn't even vote. Uh, to the, the 19, they were out of the society. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, well, mainly the 70s and on, uh, there's been a substantial change. Uh, so when you say yeah. regression, it's kind of steps it's, it's, are made and it comes back a little bit and then... And every it. time there's progress towards more freedom and democracy, there's going to be a backlash from power systems, which don't like it. So they'll try to crush it. And that's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. But it's a... <clears throat> you know, the, the backlash may succeed to an extent, but many of the victories are sustained. Mm. Uh, what, a lot of what's been achieved is going to stay. The same in Egypt. I mean, in Egypt, uh, the regime is still in place. The names have changed. Uh, the military is still in charge. They're trying to control what's happening. The U.S. is helping them. Uh, and it's a moment of kind of a stalemate. But uh, 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 even, uh, whatever happens, there will be some uh, victories that will remain, like the press is f pretty free, uh, labor can organize, 
Uh, there was just a couple of days ago a major strike action, uh, one of the big mills, which uh, had been tried before and been crushed by the dictatorship, but this time it succeeded. Actually, you know, if you, if you take a look at Egypt, there's a lot there that isn't quite understood. Uh, the the uh, This tech-savvy group of young people with their, you know, Facebook and so on, uh, they, who sort of sparked the uprising, uh, they're called the April 6th movement. Why April 6th? Well, because on April 6th, 2008, there was a major strike action called at the biggest uh, textile uh, installation in Egypt, along with solidarity actions and so on, mm. and it was crushed by the dictatorship. Mm. Well, that's April 6th. That's why they call themselves the April 6th movement. And in fact, when the labor movement, the organized labor movement, began to join the uh, current uprising, it really uh, got a lot more substance. And it's going on with the further labor organizing. Mm. Well, those are real victories. That couldn't happen under the dictatorship. No, definitely. So what are your predictions for where it's all going, you know, overseas, and maybe if it affects it here, or what, you know, what do you see for the future? You know quite a lot about the, what's happened. Well, you know, prediction is nobody <laughs> predicted it was going to take off. Okay. Uh, but the prediction in human affairs is a pretty low probability affair. Uh, too much depends on choice, you know, will and choice. But right now it looks as though, I mean, in the countries that the West really cares about, uh, the rich, the oil-rich countries with the uh, loyal dictators, uh, there they seem to have the situation under control. So in Saudi Arabia, which is the most important and the most repressive, uh, uh, there was an attempt to have a demonstration, but the, the, the security presence was so overwhelming and intimidating that people didn't even show up on the streets. So that's, for the moment, under control. Same in Kuwait. Uh, Bahrain, which is an interesting case, the, there was a Saudi-led uh, invasion to try to uh, bolster the Sunni dictatorship, and they've been pretty vicious and violent. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, torture, uh, imprisonment, uh, uh, invaded the hospital, threw out all the patients and, and doctors, you know. <clears throat> and it's all going on with a kind of a tap on the wrist now and then. Uh, they're working for us, so they're okay. Uh, Egypt and Tunisia, the Egypt most important, there's a kind of a uh, stalemate at the moment. The the protesters want more. The uh, uh, past regime is digging its heels in. Uh, the security forces are still there, different name. Uh, the military is still in charge, as they have been for half a century. And they're uh, deeply embedded in the economy and uh, the whole ruling system. And it's a kind of a standoff at the moment. So. Hard to say. We don't know how it goes. It depends. You know, it's a, I mean, to maintain the pressure is very hard because the more that the protests continue, uh, the worse the economic situation becomes and uh, people have to eat. You know? So, uh, so I, I also totally digressed with that. I was um, intending to stay with uh, philosophy actually and um but i i just digress with that because it's a once in a lifetime to meet you and so I, I have to get as much in as i can <laughs> um but just kind of going back a little bit to to these elements of the internal um sort of reflexivity uh in one way or another um and thinking about you know vehicles of uh, understanding human nature and, and how we act and why um my my interest to ask you, uh, sorry, I was interested in asking you, you know, how you feel that we can bring the internal intentions external using sort of technology, and does technology actually even do anything for us in terms of connecting? I mean, I know there's the argument that technology is a mediation, and so therefore you can never really use it as a vehicle of interaction, but so is my voice, and so is... You can, I mean, I mean technology is neutral, you know. Uh, you can use it, uh, when a hammer doesn't care whether uh, uh, it's used to build a house or to crush somebody's skull. Uh, from the hammer's point of view, it's uh, neutral. Same with the internet, uh, same with um, uh, uh, social media. Uh, you can use them constructively, and they are being used that way. 
uh, you can use them as a, uh, to isolate and control and separate people. Technology is a 